Oh, it's been a spectacular night so far, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah no, this is terrific. <laughs> yeah, I almost never get to run with poets, so it's always a great pleasure to, to listen to several such, such talented people all in a row, and so different. <laughs> And it's about as far away as you can possibly get from television script writing. <laughs> yeah, I actually wrote a script for the second season of the Outlander television show. Um, and uh, had the great privilege of going to Scotland for six weeks to uh, help them implement it. <laughs> because I had uh, I've been a consultant on the show from the beginning, which means they send me scripts, which I read through and make extensive comments on. <laughs> and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I did know from watching the daily footage, which they also send me, that a lot changes between the script that I get and the way that it comes out. And so I wanted to see how that's done. So I did, and it was a great revelation. You know, when you write a book, a novel, you're God. You know, you can do anything. You know? <laughs> if you want to start out with a 30-page soliloquy, fine. You know, if you want to have climaxes one after another, totally fine, not a problem. To write a script that is going to fit into 55 minutes of television, this is a whole different thing. To write it with three other writers and two showrunners all putting in their oar is another thing. Uh, for instance, I had one character in my script, and they said, well, you can't have him because we're going to kill him in the previous episode. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, how about Rupert? He's actually supposed to die in this episode. And they said, oh, no, you can't kill him. <laughs> I said, can I at least shoot him in the head? <laughs> I said, yeah, that'll work. You know? <laughs> so it's very much a back-and-forth cooperative sort of thing. Uh, but most writing is done alone. And we were talking over dinner about, you know, the virtues of collaboration. And, you know, there's collaboration and collaboration. Most people who write, at some point, they really need a reader, if not more than that. But uh, for me, my husband fills that function. When I've finished a scene, I write in bits and pieces and scatter them around. But I'll leave them one on his uh, sink at night when I go to bed, because I go to bed at 4.30 and he gets up at 5.30. And <laughs> I write in the middle of the night, between midnight and 4.30. And uh, he'll take it off to Starbucks and uh, read it and make notes on it and bring it back to me at lunch. Uh, consequently, I get back uh, scenes with nipples again in the margin and <laughs> <laughs> similar cogent comments. <laughs> but in fact, he's got a very good literary eye, and sometimes I'll give him something and I'll say, this doesn't quite work, but I don't know why. He'll read through it and I'll say, this is why. And he's right every time. So it's great to have a collaborator of that sort. But this is not the same thing as a collaborator who actually sticks their oar in while you're writing and said, no, let's do it this way, because <laughs> that's the way the TV people work naturally and all of the time. So it was a lot of fun, but I don't think I would do it professionally, you might say. <laughs> I mean, they did pay me for it, and they did all that to it. <laughs> so to the, I was utterly stunned to realize that I now belong to the Writers Guild of America, <laughs> which I had no idea. Uh, anyway, I, it's, it's nice to write novels, is what I'm saying. Uh, it's also nice to be in Flagstaff again. I... Uh, actually live here part-time. Uh, I still own my old family house down on Dale Street. Some of the older people here will no doubt remember one or more of my parents. And uh, yeah, then the, they will also know that my last name is pronounced Gabaldon. It's because it's a Spanish name, and if we were speaking Spanish, it would be Gabaldon. But if we're not, it's Gabaldon. We just kept the long O to be fancy. Um, <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I was actually born in Williams because uh, my parents lived in Flagstaff at the time, but the family doctor was having a feud with the Flagstaff Hospital and they wouldn't let him practice here. So, <laughs> so he practiced in Williams and my parents, were, who were 21 at the time, were forced to drive 30 miles at night over an icy road in January <laughs> and I was born in Williams, but came home at the age of two days and been here ever since. <coughs> Well, I thought what I might read for you tonight is uh, maybe a couple of shorter pieces from book nine, which is uh, called uh, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone, is the title for that one. And the title comes from a uh, widespread custom amongst beekeepers, European, but particularly Celtic, um, that holds that since bees are social insects, they're very interested in the comings and goings of a community. And so if someone is born or dies into your community, if someone leaves or comes, you must go and tell the bees. Because if you don't and the bees find out, they'll be mad and fly away. Consequently, you know, you go tell the bees that I am gone. <laughs> okay, uh, and I told that to my uh, editor, who was actually relieved, having expected something much worse. Because I told <laughs> <laughs> well, I told her that we have a collection of novellas that's coming out next summer, and I told her I wanted to call that one Selma Gundy, and she sort of turned white. <laughs> 
ground her teeth audibly. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I came up with something else, but I'm not allowed to tell you that title because they want to announce it for the flourish when they put out the cover art. Anyway, go tell the bees that I am gone won't be out you know, until probably 2018 is my best guess. It takes me three or four years to write a book. It actually takes me about two years to write a book, and the other time is spent in, uh, you know, interesting things like this, and filming <laughs> television, and you know, uh, sort of the PR aspects of writing. Well, I should say one year is spent on that, the other year is pretty much research and thinking. But I do the research and the writing at the same time, so it's kind of hard to separate those. I also do this kind of thing at the same time, so you know, it all kind of blends together. All right, well, let me see. Okay, this is uh, particularly interesting for a book festival, and that's why I chose this bit. At the end of the last book, those of you who, who read them will realize that uh, you know some of the people in my books are time travelers. And uh, in an earlier book, the younger generation was forced to return at great risk to the present because they had a young daughter with a heart defect that could only be amended in the present. Well, they returned at the end of the last book, much to everybody's relief and joy. And uh, bringing with them the daughter, who is now fine, age three, and her 10-year-old brother, and uh, this takes place soon after they have come back. They've, uh, the elder generation has just rebuilt the house that burned down two books ago. And uh, so everybody's kind of <laughs> enjoying the novelty of shelter and uh, things like that. Now, Brianna, the daughter, and the, uh, I should say the one in between, the mother of the child who had the heart problem, when coming back, came back with a large bag filled with mysterious things from the future. And everyone has been speculating as to what's in Brianna's bag. Okay, we're well, going to find out what one of those things is in this, so if you don't like that kind of spoiler, you'd probably better stick your fingers in your ears. <laughs> okay, so this is supper on Fraser's Ridge. We'd eaten supper on our new front stoop, there being no table or benches for the kitchen as yet. But for the sake of ceremony, I had made molasses cookie dough early in the day and set it aside. Everyone trooped inside and unrolled their miscellaneous bedding. Jamie and I did have a bed, but everyone else would be sleeping on pallets before the fire, and sat down to watch with keen anticipation as I dropped the cookies onto my girdle. That is Scottish for griddle. It's not actually a misspelling, as everyone assumes. Uh, these are Scots. They say creamed crud when they actually mean creamed curd. And they really do. And slid the cool black iron circle into the glowing warmth of the brick oven. How long? How long? How long, Granny? Mandy was behind me, standing on tiptoes to see. I turned and lifted her up so she could see the girdle and the cookies and the glowing shadows of the brick cubby hole built into the wall of the huge hearth. The fire we had lighted at dawn had been fed all day, and the bricks around was radiating heat and wood all night. See how the dough is in balls? And you can feel how hot it is. Don't ever put your hand in the oven. But the heat will make those balls flatten out and then turn brown, and when they do, the cookies will be done. It takes about ten minutes, I added, setting her down. It's a new oven, though, so I'll have to keep checking. Goody, 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 goody. She hopped up and down with delight and threw herself into Brianna's arms. Mama, read me a story till the cookies are done. Bri's eyebrows lifted. She glanced at Roger, who smiled and shrugged. Why not, he said, and went to rootle through the pile of miscellaneous belongings stacked against the kitchen wall. You brought a book for the bairns. That's bra, Jamie said to Bri. Where did you get it? Do they actually make books now for children Mandy's age, I asked, looking down at her. Bri had said she could read a bit already but I'd never seen anything in an 18th century print shop that looked like it would be comprehensible, let alone appealing to a three-year-old. Well, more or less, Roger said, pulling Bree's big canvas bag out of the pile. That is, there were, are, I mean, a few books that are intended for children, though the only titles that come to mind at the moment are Hymns for the Amusement of Children, The History of Little Goody Two-Shoes, and Descriptions of 300 Animals. <laughs> What sorts of animals, Jamie asked, looking interested. No idea, Roger confessed. I've not seen any of those books, just read the titles on a list. Did you ever print any books for children in Edinburgh? I asked Jamie, who shook his head. Well, what did you read when you were in school? As a bear? The Bible, he said, as though this should be self-evident. And the almanac. After we learnt the ABC, I mean. Later we did a bit of Latin. I want my book, Mandy said firmly. Gimme daddy. Please, she added, seeing her mother's mouth open. Bree shut her mouth and smiled, and Roger peered into the sack, then withdrew a bright orange book that made me blink. What? said Jamie, leaning forward to peer at it. He looked at me, eyebrows raised. I shrugged. He'd find out soon enough. Read it, Mummy. Mandy curled into her mother's side, thrusting the book into Bree's hands. Okay, Bree said, and opened it. Do you like green eggs and ham? <laughs> <laughs> Do you like them, Sam I am? <laughs> What? said Fanny incredulously, and moved to peer over Bree's shoulder, closely accompanied by Germaine. 
What is that? Jermaine asked, fascinated. Sam, I am, Mandy said crossly and jabbed a finger at the page. He got to sign. Ah, uh, oui. And what's the other thing then? Uh, who are you? <laughs> that made Fanny, Jimmy, and Roger laugh, which turned Mandy incandescent with rage. She might not have the red hair, I thought, but she had the Fraser temper at spades. Shut up, shut up, shut up, she shrieked, and scrambling to her feet, made for Germain, with the obvious intent of disemboweling him with her bare hands. <laughs> Whoa, Roger snared her deftly and lifted her off her feet. Calm down, sweetheart, he didn't mean. I could have told him, but if he hadn't learned it from sharing a household with assorted Frasers for years, it wouldn't do any good to tell him now that the very last thing you should say to one in full roar was, calm down. <laughs> like putting out an oil fire on your stove by throwing a glass of water on it. He did, Mandy bellowed, struggling madly in her father's grip. I hate him, he wound it, it's all wound. Like, oh, I hate you too. She started kicking dangerously in the vicinity of her father's crotch, and he instinctively held her out away from him. Jamie reached out, wrapped an arm around her middle, gathered her in, and put a big hand on the nape of her neck. Hush, and Ian, he said, and she did. She was panting like a little steam engine, red-faced and teary, but she stopped. We'll step outside for a moment, shall we, he said to her, and nodded to the rest of the assembled company. No one's to touch her book while we're gone, do you hear? There was a faint murmur of assent, succeeded by total silence, as Jamie and Mandy disappeared into the night. The cookies! Smelling the strong scent of incipient scorching, I darted to the oven, snatched the girdle out, and hastily flipped the cookies off onto the big plate, the only pottery dish we owned at the moment, but capable of holding anything up to a small turkey. Are the cookies okay? Jim, with a total disregard for his sister's immediate prospects, hurried over to look. Yes, I assured him, a bit brown at the edges, but perfectly fine. Fanny had come too, but was less intent on gluttony. Fanny is, is sort of a, a new adopted foster daughter. Will Mr. Fraser whip her? She whispered, looking anxious. No, Jermaine assured her, she's too little. Oh, no, she's not, Jimmy assured him, with a wary glance at his mother, whose face was distinctly flushed, if not quite as red as Mandy's. All the children clustered round me, whether out of interest in cookies or from self-preservation. I lifted an eyebrow at Roger, who went and sat down beside Brianna. I turned my back to allow a little marital privacy and sent Fanny and Jim out to fetch the big pitcher of milk, presently hanging in the well. And I did hope none of the local frogs had decided to avail themselves in defiance of the stone-weighted cloth I draped over the pitcher's mouth. I'm sorry, Granny. Jermaine edged close to me, low-voiced. I didn't mean to cause a stromash, truly. I know, sweetheart. Everybody knows except Mandy, and Grando will explain it to her. Oh, he relaxed at once, having total faith in his grandfather's ability to charm anything from an unbroken horse to a rabid hedgehog. Go get the mugs, I told him. Everyone will be back soon. The tin mugs had been rinsed after dinner and left upside down to dry on the stoop. Jermaine hurried out, carefully not looking at Bree. Jermaine thought she was angry with him, but it was apparent to me that she was upset, not angry. And no wonder, I thought sympathetically, she'd tried so hard for so long to keep Jim and Mandy safe and happy. Luckily, Roger's instincts as a husband were quite good. He had his arm round her and her head resting on his shoulder and was murmuring thanks to her, too low for me to catch the words. But the tone of it was love and reassurance, not cajolery, and the lines of her face were smoothing out. I heard soft voices in the other direction, too, through the open kitchen door. Jamie and Mandy evidently pointing out stars they liked to each other. I smiled, arranging the cookies on the platter. He probably could charm a red, rabid hedgehog, I thought. With his own good instincts, Jamie waited till the mob had reassembled and was eagerly sniffing the warm cookies. Then he carried Mandy back in and deposited her among the other children without comment. Twenty-seven, he said, assessing the array at a glance. Yes, how do you do that? Oh, it's no difficult, Sassanac. He leaned over the platter and closed his eyes, inhaling beatifically. It's easier than goats and sheep, after all. Cookies didn't have legs. <laughs> legs, said Fanny, puzzled. Oh, I, he said, opening his eyes and smiling at her. To know the number of goats you have, you just count the legs and divide by four. <laughs> the adult members of the audience groaned, and Jermaine and Jam, who had learnt division, giggled. That, Fanny began, and then stopped frowning. Sit, I said briskly. Jem, pour the milk, please. And how many cookies does each person get then, Mr. Know-it-all? Three, the boys chorused. A dissenting opinion from Mandy, who thought everyone should have five, was quelled without incident, and the whole room relaxed into a quiet orgy of cold, creamy milk and sweet-scented crumbs. Now then, Jamie said, and paused, carefully brushing crumbs off his shirt front into his palm and licking them off. Now then, he repeated, Amanda tells me she can read her book by herself. Will you maybe read it to us, Elaine, then? Yes, and with only a brief interruption for the wiping of sticky hands and face, she was ensconced once more in her mother's arms. But this time, the vivid orange book was in her own lap. She opened the cover and glared at her audience. Everybody shut up, she said firmly. <laughs> I read. <laughs>